On this episode of Game Ball NFL End Zone, we're going to discuss the last four matchups that we gave you in week three, as well as give you our predictions for the top four matchups heading into this Sunday, as well as we're going to talk about the roughing the passer issue that's been going on in the NFL. We're going to discuss that. Coming at you is Game Ball NFL End Zone, and it begins right now. NFL end zone where the football season never ends. I'm Marcus Young, Genius Jenkins. I'm Michael Riley. All right, in the first segment, of course, shout out to Luke Hardin again as well. We're going to hold it down for him for this segment. And we're well. also going to reveal his picks for week four of the NFL season as well. So let's get into it. All right, without further ado, we're going to recap the top four matchups from last weekend, starting with the Dallas Cowboys and the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle would prevail over the Cowboys by a score of 24 to 13. Uh, the second matchup as well, um, New England dropping a second straight game, um, kind of out of sorts for the Patriots. Um, they would lose to the Lions by a score of 26 to 10. However, I mean, despite all of that, Mike, the Patriots, for the most part, they were in this game up until, um, unfortunately, uh, late in the third quarter. Well, you, uh, you have to say Matt Patricia, he was the former Patriot. And he kind of knows everything and took advantage of that. But I wouldn't panic. It's still early in the season. It's pretty much the preseason for the Patriots. And Bill Belichick doesn't really care. They'll get it going. And also, what matters to them, it's mid-October, November, and December. That's when it counts. They'll get it going. They'll fix it. They'll be all right. I mean, the la- didn't they go 2-2? Two and two? Last few years, early in the season, he made it to the Super Bowl three out of four times. I mean, those are facts. History always repeats itself. So, Pats Nation, they already know what time it is. They already know that they practice for late in the season anyway. So, I mean, like I said, like last week, early in the season, I mean, they get passes because it's the Patriots. Exactly. Everybody knows what to expect out of them. Everybody the knows season. the time it is, yeah. All right, now there are two games that we are going to break down for you, and that is first and foremost the New Orleans Saints. They would beat the Atlanta Falcons by a score of 43 to 37. Mike, all I got to say is Drew Brees. Fool me once, fool me twice. The spin move. Exactly. I mean, that was dope, but I got to say something before we get into that. Who that said going to beat them Saints? Who that? Who that? Who that said they're going to beat them Saints? I mean, it was a high-scoring thriller. It was just they was throwing back and forth, running touchdown, passing touchdown, running touchdown, passing touchdown, spin move, all that. Atlanta had New Orleans on their heels until when Drew Brees started making plays to receivers, the running game got going, all that, and late two touchdowns, one to tie it and the other one to win the game. It's just that it was. Heartbreaking for Atlanta because they lost another player on defense for this season. So that's three players they lost. They lost the linebacker. They lost two safeties due to an ACL tear or one of them. They I have to look it up. But they just been beat down with injuries and just like they can't get a break. One week's another player. Another week is another player. And another week is another player. It's just like. A domino effect with the players just go down through injuries, and it's very tough. But they got to find their way to rebound and regroup, and the pass rush has to step up. And they couldn't do it against the Saints yesterday. It was just too many points. And the defense for the Saints has to do a better job not giving up a lot of points. And they gave up 140-some 
or 20-some receiving yards to a rookie and three touchdowns and Calvin Ridley, who was flat out balling out of his mind. Not Julio Jones this time, Calvin Ridley. That's why they driving him so they can take the pressure off of Julio Jones so he can win the one-on-one matchups. And Sarkeesia is doing a better job as offensive coordinator, calling the plays more and using his weapons to get open space to make plays. And that's what the critical part of him uh, this season hasn't been to start out the game in week one, and they start finally to open it up. And they opened up against the Saints yesterday, but offense can't play defense. It was a tough one for Atlanta Falcons to swallow, and the Saints has to do the much better job on defense and offensively. As long as you got Drew Brees, anything can happen. He broke back Favre's completion record. Congratulations to Drew yes. Brees for breaking that record. That record is going to stand for many years to come. So the Saints outdueled the Falcons at the end. They made too many plays offensively against that defense. And unfortunately, another player for the Falcons secondary uh, had a critical season in the injury. So that's going to be a big blow for them. But how would they recover going forward? Well, only time will tell. Right. And it's and it's kind of unfortunate for the Falcons as well because um you can't take away from the fact that Matt Ryan, five touchdown passes, side of the way, none of those touchdown passes where to Julio Jones, surprisingly, who hasn't found an end zone as of yet. And still early in the season, but still hasn't had a receiving touchdown as of yet. So we'll see how that turns around going forward into the season as well. Uh, the second matchup we're going to break down is the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Those Kansas City Chiefs, improving at 3-0, and oh, they would beat the 49ers by a score of 38-27. to uh, Once again, three touchdown passes, Patrick Mahomes. Still uh, improving, um, looking brilliant. Still, it's his poise to me that sticks out more than anything. Um, also, um, Kareem Hunt finds the end zone. The first two touchdowns uh, in this game will belong to him. Um, how would you break down this win for the Chiefs? So far, Pat Mahomes is playing with poise and confidence. Like you said, he at one play it was third down long. He turned. A disaster sack play where he spin off to until a touchdown. He just threw it in there, and the receiver was dimer touchdown. And Tyreek Hill, he's five foot nine, went up to this highest point over two defenders and caught the ball. I mean, five foot nine. He's got blazing speed, but he's got hops as well. His bunny is so sick. It's just like uh. For those who don't know what bunny means, it means your hops, how high you jump, your bunny game. So that's what we terminate to and slang term as bunny means how high you jump. You got hops. So his bunny game, it was just like ridiculous for a five foot nine looking like Spud Webb in the NBA right. there for a second. I mean, I'm just saying. And uh, defensively, it's still an issue. With the secondary, because they're going to run to a high, a high power offense who has offense and defense that they may not recover. Their test is still to come. We'll find out Monday and see how they perform. But as so far, when they score points, they are built to lead the points, or are they built for behind once they get into the tougher teams? We'll find out and see. Patrick Mahomes, a.k.a. Mahomey, is doing real good so far. The running game's effective. Travis Kelsey's balling out of his mind. Sammy Watkins is doing a thing. I mean, he is catching balls just out there. But, of course, the cheating man, he's going to do his thing regardless. So, the offense is just too many weapons. Who are you going to stop who? But it's the defense that's concerning. Yes. Especially the secondary. They gave up way too many yards. And it's unfortunate it broke down today that the 49ers lost their quarterback for the season through an ACL tail and just signed a big contract. It was a huge blow for him. I feel bad for Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, he was just he was making his way on his way to become a star and a, a major setback with ACL tear, and also they're not going to have their veteran cornerback Richard Sherman, who has a calf injury for about a few weeks now. Yep. So it's going to be tough for the 49ers, but 
We'll see can they overcome it. Only time will tell. All right, and Kansas City Chiefs improving to three and zero before they march into a pretty tough October. Uh, like you just mentioned, they go to Denver to start off that uh, month, and once again they have the Patriots that month. They have Denver twice, and they also have the Jacksonville Jaguars, who are coming off of um, a loss. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. Um, that's going to conclude the first segment of the podcast. When we come back, we're going to talk about the roughing the passer. We'll break down exactly what roughing the passer is. Mike, and he'll give you his, his thoughts on the whole roughing the passer rule. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Game ball, NFL, and so I'm coming back at you. season never ends now in the second segment we're going to talk about the new uh rough and the passer rule that has been put into place um, for those who don't know of course what rough and the passer is that's generally where a defender basically hits the quarterback after the ball has been released from his hands now getting into this um uh, basically the nfl has implemented a, a controversial rough and the passer rule uh that started this off season um, nobody can really even say, not even the officials necessarily have been able to really break down like exactly what it, what constitutes roughing the passer. Um, the emphasis on this, this season basically restricts tacklers from landing on top of a quarterback with his full or most of his body weight. Um, now this week, the biggest one came with uh, the Green Bay Packers defense um, linebacker, Clay Matthews. Um, this one, actually, how would you even break that down with that uh, particular play that basically cost the Green Bay Packers a game. I mean, it's cost him two games so far, and he's been called for that three straight weeks. I mean, he's doing everything he can to not uh, put his full body weight on the quarterback. I get it that the league is trying to make the game safer, and I get it by the letter of the law. This is the right call, but I mean, if he falls on him, like, dude, what can you do? And you see why pl defensive players are getting injured. It was reported that today that somebody tore ACL uh, this uh, in the game yesterday for this call because they want to avoid rushing from the passer. Right. I'm like, it's going to get defensive player hurts and it's costing games. For instance, like, Week two, Green Bay Packers have play against Minnesota. Clay Matthews had a clear cut, cut, clean yeah. sack. It was clean and it wasn't forced for anything. And flag roughing the passer. And the defensive player intercepted the ball with a big game over. And here comes the yellow flag. I'm like, he cannot catch a break. It's just like going here, going there, and all this other stuff. I'm like, he can't catch a break. And I just feel bad for the for Clay Matthews, and I understand that the NFL is trying to make the game softer. And there's also rough of the passer call. You hit the quarterback after the ball. That's rough of the throws the ball rough of the passer. You go beneath and hit his knee. That's rough of the passer. If you pick him up and pile drive him or body slam him, that's rough of the passer. Right. I get all that, but what can you do when you go full speed? He's tackling him, and his head is away from the other opponent's helmet. He falls on him a little bit and rolls over. How can you call that rough in the passer? I don't understand. It's just driving me insane, even though I never did play defense. But come on. And the coach was hot. I mean, he was about to fight the referee for real. He had to be broken up, and you can't blame him. I would have fought the referee, tried to fight the referee too, and took a fine for that. Because it cost them two games. The one against Green, uh, excuse me, against Minnesota, and the other one against Washington to where 
It was like a very close game until that call, and Washington took advantage of it, scored touchdowns, and pretty much was a debacle game after that. I'm just like, what is, I'm like, this is nonsense. This is madness. It caused games and all that, and you're looking at to like the playoff scenario picture to where Green Bay might not make the playoffs this year because of that. I'm just like, wow. What can you do? I'm like, we're doing every day that you said that we're supposed to do, and we still get flagged for it. I'm just like, either get it right or don't make the call. I understand you try to make the game separate all that. Come on, man. Really? Ever since Roger Dale took over as commissioner in 2006, this is a true theory, there's been more penalized and more flags uh, in the NFL than once was back in the day when uh, the other commission was still commissioner. But now, ever since Roger Goodell took over as commissioner, there's been more fines and more penalties due to these rules that were in place. So could you put that part of Roger Goodell? Sure you can. I'm just like, this is not flag football. This is a violent sport. And there is a long-term health effect that go with it. And we get that. We sacrifice. I'm not using me just to, because I never play a bomb sack like Sam before the other players that's playing in the league. They're saying we cannot, excuse me, start over. We put our bodies online for this game, the game we love, and plus to feed our families and all that. Mm -hmm. We can't feed our families and you keep docking us all these fines for the we're trying to do the best way we can. But how can we do the best thing we can? And you still get flagged, you still get fined for it, even though it's not unnecessary rubbers. Tony Dungy was saying it last night, he explained it best on NBC, the Patriots against the Lions game. It's the right call by the letter of the law, but come on, man, you gotta let that go. He didn't pile drive him. He fell on and rolled off. I'm like, how are you supposed to tackle the sack the quarterback now? Just twist him out, throw him, and cause more injuries? How can you do that? And other people said it best. Even the former NFL official is the right call by the letter of the law. But he didn't like that call either. I'm like, he fell on him. He didn't pile drive him like, ugh, ugh, ugh. He just fell and rolled off. I mean, what can you do? I'm just, it's just ridiculous, and they need to change some, or else you're going to have a more uproar about this call, and this could cause more teams to game, especially if they're trying to make the playoffs. You think rules like this in place, just really quickly, do you think that this could be something like the way that they're doing this now that people are going to be afraid to touch the quarterback? I'm afraid to say something like that. Yes, it's a possibility that could. And also, by doing that, you're risking more injuries for the defensive players because they have to let up a little bit. Right. Say, if you let up, let up and you step on the ground and all of a sudden, pile, you feel something you need because you're trying to avoid a rough the passer. And chances are you're going to tear an ACL or have an MCL sprain or have a lower leg injury due to that. So they need to come together and find a way to get this right or else you're going to have more of these come, more injuries and more games are lost and teams with playoff hopes coming down to the wild card can be out the wild card playoffs because of this mess. I mean, it's definitely a huge risk, I mean, like you were just talking about, because why that person's letting off, don't forget you also have a number of defenders that's still going to be going full speed at you because they're trying to protect the quarterback or, or protect the running back. So, I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that it's, it's really a contradiction, I mean, more than anything. I mean, so, it's, it's, it's cost the Green Bay Packers two games, a loss and a draw. So... Getting to the playoffs and possibly win their division, it could hurt them because of the Clay Matthews situation. Luckily, it didn't cost them in week one, but the last two weeks, week two and week three, it's been hurting them. So what can you do? I'm just like, we're trying 
to do the best way we can and it's going to cost more teams games going out on the line and you're going to have an uproar so right now they have to change this rule or have a big uproar about it all right that's going to conclude the second segment for game ball nfl end zone when we come back we got the top four matchups heading into week four for you guys to keep an eye out on stick around with us game ball nfl end zone we'll be back in a minute don't go anywhere stay tuned don't touch that dial Game Ball Info end zone where the football season never ends. Now we're going to jump into the third part of the podcast, and that is talking about the top four matchups heading into week four, starting with the Cincinnati Bengals and the Atlanta Falcons. We know the Falcons um, are at home again against the Cincinnati Bengals after that heartbreaking loss um, at home to the New Orleans Saints. Mike, what do you like about this matchup? Well, it's going to be Cincinnati's offense versus the depleted Falcons defense and you're not going to have Jones there you're not going to have Neil there and also you're not going to have the other safety there is going to be very critical Atlanta's defense get to a fast start you that guy Ross who is a speed demon he's still learning how to uh, adapt to the NFL route tree all that but he still can make plays you got Mixon who could possibly come back after missing last week's game and you got uh, A.J. Green, balling out his mind. Uh, he had three touchdowns in the first half against the Baltimore Ravens about a week ago. I mean, Andy Dalton's played a little bit better, and the offensive line has improved. But how would they do in the second half? We'll find out. And the Bengals' defense, they're playing some pretty good ball right now, but how they going to hold up against Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley, the rookie wide receiver, who was just balling out his mind yesterday. He was making everybody's fantasy points look good. He made my fantasy team look good. Thank you, Calvin Ridley, for doing that. Your boy, holler back. So, uh, yeah, it's just going to come down to who has the ball last at the end which offensive defense is going to make more plays than the other opponent's offensive defense. It's going to come down to the last two-minute drive, who's going to have the ball and not make mistakes. All right. And in that game, um, Andy Dalton uh, uh, apparently looking to kind of redeem himself in a way. Of course, he threw four picks last weekend. So definitely looking to kind of shake that off a little bit as he goes into Atlanta. Uh, the second game we're going to talk about is the Philadelphia Eagles and the Tennessee Titans. The question that I have here, Mike, is we know that Marcus Merrill is banged up. Um, he hurt his throwing arm. He would go back into the game uh, last weekend to uh, win 9-6. to six. Um, The question that I have is do you expect Marcus Merrill to play in this game or oh. will he be out? Oh, he'll play uh, because you have a bum quarterback and he's also in a concussion protocol. So he's not going to play. So Marcus Mario is going to play. But for the Tennessee Titans to, to have success against the Philadelphia Eagles defense, you have to run the ball effectively. You have to get some completions going, get some screens going, to take some shots down the field. But you can't turn the ball over. You have to. This is Marcus Mario's third year. You have to open up the playbook for him to make plays. I guess the Jacksonville Jaguars. I understand. You have to keep it simple and not screw it up to win that game by a field goal. If they can do that and play good defense, then they'll beat Philadelphia Eagles. Now, for the Eagles, they got a huge break of Carson Wentz coming back from that ACL tear. He played really well. He struggled for some bit, but he played well, and it went over the Colts. I mean, it was a rust game for him. It was just like a – warm-up tune-up game to get that rust off. But once Carson Wentz gets his form coming, he, he, he's going to ball out, and he has to protect himself and protect that knee and not re-injure it again because 
Defensive players is going to go after that knee now. Let's Absolutely. not forget. They're going to test that knee. But at the same time, the, uh, the running game has to get better for the Philadelphia Eagles. The defense has to get better because they could have lost this game against the Colts. I mean, it was a four-point game, but they was able to make more plays, and they was able to get the win. So if Philadelphia Eagles wants to win this game on the road, they have to play good football and be efficient on offense and not have turnovers, and defense has to make plays. All right. The third matchup we're going to talk about, the Baltimore Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mike, how would you break down this particular matchup? This is going to be a physical game. It's always, in, especially in the AFC North, this game is going to determine who's going to have the lead in the AFC North going uh, for this month, going to the month uh, towards the end, and who's going to win it. Uh, both defenses are garbage. Let's just face that. Face the fact. At least, but one offense can score more points than the other offense. It seems like the Ravens' offense can get lost at times and not put up points that they can. Either they put up points where it's way too late, or something else happens. I don't know, but they have to get out of that funk and score points on the very first drive. Field goal, fine. Touchdown, you want more uh, than a field goal. So, touchdown be great. And defensively, you have to play better. They got to find a way to play better. You, uh, you got to find a way to stop Antonio Brown and make him frustrated. You have to get to big men. And if you can do that, you win this game. For Pittsburgh Steelers, offensive defense. Defense, you got to find a way to stop. Stop teams from scoring, throwing in, running all over you. I mean, you got to get turnovers. The secondary has to step up, and they have to stay healthy. That's been their biggest issue is the secondary. They're not the still curtain like they once was on the defense because people used to fear the still curtain defense. Even when uh, Troy Palomato, you had Ryan mm -hmm. Clark and the crew, you had – uh, other players, Lamar Woodley and the crew, and Casey ha uh, Hampton, they were still making plays. They were just, oh, still curtain up. Oh, also, you had James Harrison, but those guys are not there anymore. It's the new generation of the Steelers defense, and I'm not going to call them the steel curtain like they once were. So if they can find a way to make plays, defense and get their offense chance to make plays, then they, then they can win some games. All right. The Baltimore Ravens also going into this one with a huge win uh, in week three as well. Uh, the fourth and final matchup that I want to break down for you is the Kansas City Chiefs looking to jump to 4-0 and going into Denver, which would be on a Monday night in their first of four tough games for them for the month of October. Uh, Mike, what do you think about this matchup? This is the biggest game for Patrick Mahomes. This is the biggest stage for him. Monday Night Football, Mile High Stadium with that altitude weather. How can you handle that? Well, last season, he got the win on the road because it's basically garbage time. Where yeah. They already made the playoffs. But this time, both teams got a pretty good record. One is 3-0 and and the other one is 2-1. This is for the divisional league who takes the division. Everything is riding on this game. Everything's going to be riding on the next game. So it's going to come out to where who's going to make more plays at the end. The Kansas City Chief high, uh, excuse me, high power offense versus Denver's no fly zone defense. And they got the cover guys that can stop. Not stop, but that can cover the Chiefs uh, receivers. So, and you're on the road. And who's going to block Von Miller? I mean, Von Miller is playing out of his freaking mind right now. I'm like, he might be the defensive player of the year. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's up for an MVP award for defensive player. And you got Bradley Chubb who's playing some good ball. The numbers is not there yet, but at least he's getting pressure and forcing the quarterback to be uncomfortable in the pocket. For the issue I have is the Denver offense. Uh, you got Case Keenan still trying to learn the system and all that stuff. And you're going to run to one of those teams that 
that got good defense. You can't come back and bail them out at the end. But and it, that's not the case against Kansas City Chiefs defense, and especially their secondary. So that might cut them some slack a little bit, but you still have to go out and score the first points of the game. Now, for the defense of the Chiefs, you're on the road. You're going to have to play good ball. Emmanuel Sanders is playing good ball right now. He's getting open left and right. So they have to find a way to cover him and find a way to stop Demarius Thomas and stop the running game. If they can do that, the Chiefs will be fine on defense. So it's going to be a hard-fought nose game. It's going to be a dog fight to the end, but we'll find out and see. All right, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, a tough test on the road for them as well. The Broncos looking to bounce back after receiving their first loss of the season at home. And, of course, we're going to get into it, and that is the predictions part of the episode, starting with Cincinnati versus Atlanta. Who do you got? I'm going with Atlanta Falcons at home. I just feel like that bad taste in the mouth, loss at home against New Orleans Saints, they're down one game in the division, and I feel like Cincinnati is a fairy tale. They start off good, then they slap your face and be Fusco and start losing. So I'm going to say that's about to start happen for the Bengals. They could prove me wrong, but I'm just not buying to the Bengals right now. So I'm going to say the Atlanta Falcons get their win at home. It will be a close margin because Atlanta does not have all their pieces, especially on defense. They lost three players with season the injuries. That is very critical. But I still believe that Matt Ryan and the crew are going to make more plays in the Cincinnati Bengals. So... I'll say a very close tight game to score of 28 to 24. Atlanta gets it done at home. And Luke picks the Falcons as well to beat the Bengals. I would agree with the both of you. I think Andy Dalton will play a lot better. I don't see him throwing four picks in a row, or excuse me, not four picks in a row, but four picks, period, um, against the Atlanta Falcons. But I agree with you. I can't see them dropping two games. Um, at home twice uh, before they go on the road next week. So I think they'll get it done at home as well. Um, I'm going to say 20, 28 to 14 is my score. I think they'll beat Cincinnati. Uh, the second game, the Philadelphia Eagles and the Tennessee Titans. Mike, who do you got? Uh, it's going to be a dogfight. I have the Eagles in a slim, not slim, but a close margin. I'm going to say the Eagles find a way to score a late touchdown. They end to win a close game. It's going to be defensively. But I say the Eagles will have to ball back the last few minutes of the game and score the late touchdown. I'm going to say 17 to 10, the Eagles over the Titans. And Luke has picked the Eagles over the Titans as well. I like Philadelphia as well. Um, I think Carson's wins. I think he'll feel a little bit more comfortable. Of course, like everyone was uh, mentioning, including yourself, kind of shaking off that rust a little bit. Still did throw for 235 yards, I believe. Uh, still look brilliant at times. Mm -hmm. um, I think he'll get more comfortable with this game. Mariota's already banged up as it is. I, I don't know if, the, if, if I want to give this one a close one. Um, I mean, they, they did. The defense played extremely well for Tennessee uh, last week. Um, that could be the thing. I think Carson Wentz will find a way to get it done. I'm going to say they'll win by a score of, I don't know if this is going to be a high-scoring affair. Um, I'm going to say 21-14. I like Philadelphia. The Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers, Mike. The battle of both teams not having a defense and which team is going to make more plays than the other opponent and I'll say the Pittsburgh Steelers will sneak one out there on a late field goal to win. I'm gonna say this Pittsburgh Steelers win a score of 24 to 22 against the Ravens on a late field goal drive. All right, I'm gonna agree. Um, I like Pittsburgh with this one as well. Uh, Joey Flacco was pretty brilliant last weekend. I mean, he was. He's a great quarterback, but he's not someone that I'm just want to put all my money on. He's on a like fool's, basis. He's a fool's go quarterback. I see what you're saying. And Luke has pit the Ravens to win what? on the road against the wow. Steelers. He's picking the Baltimore Ravens to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's Luke's pick. I just I can't see Flacco outgunning Ben Roethlisberger on the road. I don't see it happening. Um, I just, it's going to be a very physical game because 
Every time these teams play, it, there has rarely been a blowout. Absolutely. And I just think that that loss at home that Pittsburgh suffered to Kansas City, I just don't see them allowing another quarterback to go in there and, and still win. I just I can't see that happening personally. Um, I think the Steelers will find a way to get this one done as well. I'm going to say 35, 35 to 28, I'll give it uh, Pittsburgh over Baltimore. Uh, the final pick, Chiefs Nation. Going into Mile High Stadium, who do you got? Man, I've been wrestling with this one. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a dogfight. I think the game's going to live up to this height. I um, hope i wrong, but I'm going with my gut. I'm picking the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, I'm doing it with both <laughs> hands to win on the road. And very tough Mile High State, not State, Mile High Stadium environment. I must say a slim hair margin on another late field goal. I must say the Kansas City Chiefs beat the Denver Broncos on the road. Patrick Mahomes gets it done on a late field goal drive, and the kicker wins by a field goal. Score of 27 to 24. The Chiefs on the road get it done at Denver. And Luke, he's going with his Broncos <laughs> to win against the Chiefs. So he has the Broncos winning against the Chiefs. There's a song called Make Me a, Beli a Believer. Um, I'm believing in the Chiefs. I just think they have a lot of weapons offensively. And what helped the Kansas City Chiefs is now that you have Kareem Hunt. He's feeling comfortable. He has two touchdowns on his belt. So now they have found a way to get the ground game going and a, and, and a passing game. And, and, and the thing is, if, if everybody's been following the Broncos, one of their biggest questions right now has been their ability to really stop the passing game isn't what it normally has been. Can they correct that in time? They're going to be at home. Of course, they just suffered the first loss of the season. Ron Miller, not too happy about that one. If you've seen the press conference. And it's the no-fly zone defense. And they still got a good defense, but I just don't trust the offense enough. That's my issue, and that's why I'm picking the Chiefs to win a very close game by a hair of the chinny-chin-chin. I'm going to say this goes in the overtime. I'm going to say this goes in the overtime. Oh, we have an overtime prediction. What? I think this one will go in the overtime. This is going to be a great game. I'm going to say the Chiefs will come out on top. I will say... They will win by a score. I'll say they they won twenty eight to twenty one on the road. The Chiefs won crew to four and zero. All right, lead the way. All right, that's gonna do it for this edition of Game Ball NFL End Zone and social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Game Ball College Kickoff, Game Ball NFL End Zone. Email us at gck.gnfle at gmail.com. Send us an email. Uh, give us some feedback, whatever. And also, we are open to talk about which games you want us to debate. So send us some matches, and we will debate and give your name and all that information. Just your name, but not anything else. Let me make that clear. So do that. And also, you can follow us on Twitter at GCK underscore GNFLE. You can follow your boy, all capitalized, Game Ball Mike, excuse me, Game Ball underscore Mike, and follow us on Instagram at GCK underscore GNFLE. Get your clothes again or all our clothing website at tokendesignstopeka.com slash Game Ball. That's T-O-K-A-N designstopeka.com slash Game Ball. Hit our YouTube channel, like, subscribe, hit that subscribe button, my right to yes. your left, vice versa. Give it a thumbs up, give it a thumbs down at gck.gnfletv. That is our YouTube channel. You can follow Luke on Luke Harnett. Two at Twitter. That's who Harnett Two people, and you can follow him on Facebook and Instagram. I'm gonna switch it over to you. All right, you can find me on Facebook, Marcus Jovell Nt Jenkins, and also you can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram as well at Jovell Nt. That's J O V E L L E E N T, all one word. All right, I'm Michael Riley. I'm Marcus Young Genius Jenkins, and this is Game Ball NFL End Zone, where the football season never ends. Peace. We are out.